All right, take your seats. Just the last couple of people coming in. Put your hands together if you like the brisket. How was that? Fantastic. We had lots of conversations out there, lots of networking, people meeting study partners. It's so fantastic to be back in person after suffering through the online world. Let's talk about fever in the returning traveler. This is one of the top rated lectures, and I absolutely love giving it because it's amazing how few people get a good lecture on fever in the returning traveler. If you've got a returning traveler, and they've got fever, you need to consider malaria. Great, let's move on to the next lecture. So the next topic is on travel medicine. Travel medicine. Focusing on travel medicine, what else do we need to talk about? Patient in your Sioux, 10 minutes in, they start talking about their upcoming trip to Thailand. What vaccines do I need for my trip to Thailand? Okay. Uh, it's amazing how many residents just freeze and they panic. When you bring up travel counseling, free travel counseling, fever and returning travel, you can just see them like stop and their brain starts like listing through tropical diseases that they think they maybe have heard the names of once or twice and they panic. And it's not that hard. It's not that difficult. You know the questions you need to ask. You're going to ask your usual history questions about past medical history, past surgical history, medications, allergies, family history, social history. And there's only a few more that you must ask every time someone's coming for pre-travel counseling. You need to ask, when are you going for the vaccine timing? Where are you going? Oh, I'm going to Bangkok. How long are you going for? Oh, I'm going to Bangkok for three days or a week or a month or two years. And it's actually really important to ask, why are you going? Because a traveler who comes to your clinic because they're going to Bangkok for a business conference is a very different risk profile than a traveler who comes and they're going to Bangkok to get in as much sex tourism as humanly possible in their six day vacation. And that may make you uncomfortable, but you know where this guy is going for his pre-travel counseling. He's going to the CCFB hospital to see you. And at the CCFB hospital, they love throwing curveballs. They love giving you vague situations or situations that they're hoping will make you feel uncomfortable because they want to see if you're going to go, Ugh. So even if you do that in your head, because that may not be something that you're interested in doing, you need to be prepared and ready to meet this guy when he comes to you at the CCFB hospital. So management is more than medication. It's amazing. People just panic. They freeze. They go, uh, vaccines, Twinrix, Cipro. And that's their whole like comprehensive pre-travel management. So there's lots more than that. There's lots more than that. We're going to talk about specifically not just the Twinrix, not just the hepatitis A and B vaccines, but we're going to talk about country-specific vaccines. You need to be aware of where is it that they're traveling to. Paul mentioned the meningitis belt, for example. Yellow fever is actually a really easy one because you have to tell them, go to a yellow fever clinic because not every family doctor can give a yellow fever vaccine. So even though I did a global health fellowship, even though I've worked in my residency and training in pre-travel clinics, I still tell people when I'm in my practice or they come to urgent care for pre-travel counseling, which they kind of shouldn't, but they do anyways, I say, go, go to a travel clinic to consider getting yellow fever vaccination if that's indicated for your area. And routine testing, routine vaccinations. What if their flu is not up to date? What if their tetanus isn't up to date? Sure as heck want to make sure you get all the routine vaccines up to date. That's specifically from the one of five topics. Now, how many of you, show your hand, if you use the CDC yellow book for your pre-travel counseling? CDC yellow book, you type in the country name, yellow book, fantastic. Great tool, I use it as well in clinic. But when you're studying for your CCFP Canadian exam, make sure you're using the PHAC tool when you're studying because there are some subtle differences. Sure, malaria outbreaks are the same in all parts of the world. CDC and PHAC are going to say use anti-malarials for the same places. But they actually have differing and conflicting guidelines when it comes to typhoid vaccine. The CDC guidelines and you'll probably have seen this with your patients, it says, you know, for most rural travel, for most, most South American travel, for most Caribbean travel, for most African travel, most Southeast Asian travel, give the typhoid vaccine. That's different in Canada. The Canadian PHAC guidelines say something totally different. They say only if you're going to this part of the world, only if you're going to this part of the world should you be giving typhoid vaccine. What other phases of the trip are there. There's the pre-travel, during travel, after travel. You need to know which meds are indicated and which precautions are indicated at each stage. So anti-malarials, obviously, you start before you go. Anti-diarrheals, you might want to take prophylactically during your trip. We'll talk about which one you can take prophylactically because that's new. And also 
which anti antidiarrheal medication do you take to treat dysentery, you, to treat your bloody fever and <laughs> diarrhea during the trip? And when you get back, remember when Zika was super cool. It was really sexy. Everyone was talking about Zika, Zika virus, not getting uh, pregnant for months after your trip. Be aware of those because there might be a few old Zika questions kicking around. When it comes to anti-malarial prophylaxis, there's a bunch of different options. You should know a pro and con of each one. Most commonly, atavagone and proguanol. This is malarone. This is probably the one that you get prescribed. If you're going on a trip, it's straightforward. It's a bit expensive. You take uh, one pill a day, and you only need to take it for a week after you get back. That's why it's so popular. What if you're allergic to it? What if you're pregnant? What if you need something else? What if you want something cheaper? Doxycycline is a great cheap alternative, but it can give you photosensitivity. And you sure as heck know your patients are going to be pretty annoyed if you, they're going to a sunny destination and you give them a pill that causes sunburn. Thanks, doc. Thanks a lot. Now, what if they're pregnant? What is the medical advice for pregnant people who are traveling to a malarial risk area? Don't travel. What? Well, I mean, obviously, it's not really practical advice, but that's what the guidelines say right now. Tell your patients, if you're pregnant, going to a malarial risk area, medically speaking, we do not recommend that because the risk is too great. There aren't great treatments if you're pregnant. If you must go, then, well, there are options. There's mefloquine. I took mefloquine once as a, as a pre-travel uh, test dose. The doc was like, here, let's take a test dose of mefloquine. Take a pill on Monday, take a pill on Tuesday, take a pill on Wednesday. Bad idea. This is not standard of care. Nobody else does this. Mefloquine is dosed once a week. So I was given a month's worth of mefloquine, which has a lot of neuropsychiatric side effects, which was a real fun month for me as those levels were going down out of my system, let me tell you. Didn't get arrested. Got pretty close. Anyways, crimiquin is ended, up, ended up being what they prescribed me because this is before the malarone days. And before they prescribe you primiquin, they do one blood test to see can you take this? Do you have a deficiency in what? G6PD, phenomenal. Chloroquine is another option, but there are CMPA cases of docs who, their neighbors like, oh, I'm going to Africa next week. Should I take anything? Yeah, sure. Here's a prescription for chloroquine. And then the patient died when they got chloroquine-resistant malaria, and the family sued the doctor, and everyone in the court was like, why would you even, like, the, why would you do this? His own lawyer was like standing up. He's like, it's chloroquine resistant malaria. Why would you even do, prescribe chloroquine? So make sure you don't do that. Make sure you check the resistance before you prescribe your anti-malarial. How do we treat malaria? Might you have to treat malaria in Canada? Raise your hand if you've seen malaria in Canada, seen a malaria patient in Canada. I see hands up all over the place. Most of you haven't seen malaria because all those patients with malaria are going to the CFPC hospital. So you'll see them there. But you got to be ready for this. There's a great uh, TV show, Discovery Channel, filmed in Vancouver General Hospital Emergency. And there's an episode where there's a girl who's medevac from Trail, rural British Columbia, because she went to Africa for fun, didn't take any pills, flew home, and got malaria. And she was severely anemic from her malaria. So yes, you do need to know how to treat this for your exam. You need to know what are the possible medications, what are the possible combinations. And if your patient has prolonged QT, maybe avoid the drug with a Q in it, the quinine. Now, Zika should brush up on that before your exam in case there's a few leftover questions. So there's a great British medical journal infographic we got for you. When people travel, it's fascinating because we focus so much on diarrhea, hepatitis, malaria, infection, infection, infection. But what is the number one cause of morbidity and mortality in travelers? It's not a disease. It is motor vehicle accidents. So my preceptor, when I was a resident and he was giving pre-travel advice, you know what he said to patients? If you're going to a developing nation, do not drive in a car after dark, period. That's, that's the travel medicine official advice. That's your safest possible option. Do not travel after dark in a car. He said the roads are less well-maintained. The cars are less well-maintained. The drivers are less well-maintained. That's what he would say to patients. I wouldn't say that anymore. But he says, you got to limit your high-risk activity because you're more likely to get injured in a motor vehicle accident than any other morbidity cause when you're traveling. You also want to limit other high-risk activities, such as sexual activity. We really do appreciate your feedback, evaluation, comments. Uh, last year, somebody was highly offended by this slide, so this year, we've, we've censored it. So hopefully, this isn't as offensive to you. 
It's a good picture, though. Like, if you want to see it, text me after. Like, it's really, it's, it's a good one. So this guy is going for sex tourism or people when they go on vacation, when they go to Calgary for a review course, they, they let loose, they have fun. There's going to be parties tonight. There might be hookups. I think there have been hookups from the review course, one that we've got documented. They, they got married as a result. I didn't even know that. They got married after a result of coming to the review course. So your potential future spouse could be in this room. Your potential future ex-spouse could be in this room today. Can you believe that? Isn't that exciting? So when people travel, they let loose. They have high-risk activity. They have fun. They let their guards down. So comment on that. Warn your patients. Bring condoms with you. Don't check your medication in your luggage. It's straight in the 105 Topics. Not just because the people who write the 105 Topics fly Air Canada. And they know what Air Canada does to suitcases. But also, you want to be familiar with what, like, what if you need your insulin and it's in the luggage hold? Or what if you brought extra insulin on the plane, but in the luggage hold, they brought the temperature down because there weren't any pets down there. They didn't turn on the heater and it denatured your insulin. When it comes to traveler's diarrhea, there's a new CFP journal article just a couple years ago. Great infographic I print out for my patients. What should you pack about diarrhea? Oral rehydration, loperamide, emodium. That's new. That's different. We used to say don't take emodium for traveler's diarrhea. You don't want to like gum up your guts when you've got all these nasty bacteria in there. The new guidelines say it's fine as long as you don't have dysentery. If you don't have severe diarrhea, you're not bleeding, totally fine to take emodium. Which antibiotic is it? It's no longer Cipro. Too much Cipro resistance. Pregnant people can take Azithro. Kids can take Azithro. Everyone can take Azithro. And when it comes to bismuth, that is a great treatment for traveler's diarrhea. It's also a prevention for people who really want to take a four times a day pill and make their poop turn black and their tongue turn black and get constipated from the Pepto-Bismol. It's a great option for traveler's diarrhea prevention. Be careful though. There's kids' Pepto-Bismol. It looks like Pepto-Bismol. It says Pepto-Bismol on the package. The, the little pills look like Pepto-Bismol. They got the same little triangle stamp on them. But what's the active ingredient? Anyone know? It's calcium carbonate. It's Tums. For, so kids' Pepto-Bismol is not bismuth. It's, it's basically Tums that looks like Pepto-Bismol, just like ginger gravel. I'm sure lots of people have bought ginger gravel, and they're looking at the pill box. They're like, why isn't there any actual gravel in this? It's just ginger. So be careful when you're reading these over-the-counter medications. What else do we need to know for traveler's diarrhea? Boil it, peel it, cook it, or forget it, if you want to avoid diarrhea or hep A transmission. Avoiding ice cubes, salads, uncooked veggies. Use bottled water. Basically, have no incredible dining on your vacation. Just get rid of all those fun things. No street meat. Wash your hands all the time. Now, could it be that your patient comes to see you on their way to Summit Everest? Absolutely. You are now an altitude medicine specialist. So, what do you need to know? Which prophylactic medication do you give him? Acetazolamide is a common drug dispensed at the CFPC hospital. What if he said, I'm allergic to acetazolamide and I want a drug that lets me treat the edema and not just prevent it? Dexamethasone is going to be your friend. Dexamethasone. Now, we briefly made a joke about fever in the returning traveler. I really want you to know about malaria because it's a really important diagnosis. People can die from falciparum malaria within two days. So... If you've missed that diagnosis, your patient could die. If you can't find your patient, you just send them to the lab to get tested for it, and then you try calling them, and they're not answering the phone, they're probably dead. You probably killed them because you didn't think about it and send them to emergency room. So in all seriousness, if I have a patient comes to urgent care and I'm, they're, they're at risk for malaria, I send them to ER so that they can be sitting in the waiting room while we're waiting for that test to come back. Traveler's diarrhea is the second cause. Third cause is respiratory infections. More com like the fourth, fifth, sixth causes, those are all common infections. It's amazing how, again, you, your brain hits a block. You're like, oh my gosh, fever and a turning traveler. Okay, this is going to be awful. So, they, so you, you went overseas, you went to Africa, and you got some sort of tro weird tropical disease, and, and it burns when you pee. There's blood in your pee too. Oh my gosh, just a smiosis. Uh, you got shigella, and you're panicking, and you start having this fever as a non-returning traveler, and you start sweating. And you're like, okay, so it burns when you pee. You got flank pain. Oh my goodness, what rare tropical disease is this? And you don't stop and think, oh my, they, they've got a pilo. Like they've got a garden variety urinary tract infection. So don't get into the rut. Don't panic when you get into your fever and returning traveler. Yes, malaria is important. Yes, traveler's diarrhea is common. But the number three cause is the flu or pneumonia. And right up there in the top five causes is urinary tract infection. So you got this. You can handle it. I believe in you. If you need a tool, when you're in your clinic, you can pull up this fantastic British medical journal, 
review article. It's a great infographic that helps go through and figure out what are the key pertinent findings for my fever in returning traveler.